All right, teammates, 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 we are back once again. If this is your first time listening to the Move Swiftly podcast, welcome to the show. Welcome to the number one show on innovative teamwork. We come at you every single day, new episodes daily. We do not stop. We do not stop. We do not stop. So thank whoever brought you here. To my regular listeners, you know what you know what we're about. You already you, you can say it before I say it. The expectation is we bring people on that have incredible stories, that have incredible messages, and are here to serve you. Today I have Aaron Guyett, founder of Leaders of Leaders, who has a absolutely magnificent story that is all rooted in a in a deep faith, all rooted in a love for God, and is wears it on his sleeve, is bold and is not afraid or ashamed at all to talk about how much he loves Jesus Christ. And people like that, man, always have a seat on this show. So <laughs> with all that, man, Aaron, welcome to the show, man. Man, thank you so much, Asman. Uh it's uh my pleasure and honor. Yeah. So you know, like I was telling you, I, I've been listening to you and several other shows, and you are incredibly, incredibly transparent about everything that you've gone through from young to, you know, leading people in the Marines and what you've gone through in high school and things like that. And I I think the best place to start this off would be speak on some of the, not me, I'm a football guy. I played football from seven years old all the way to 21. And you actually were in high school and you were very insecure and you developed some confidence and then then you went out for the teams and sports teams and like that so it's kind of a different place but we both still kind of landed in the fitness world so one of the things that i think uh the best uh, the best place to start would probably be just talk a little bit about your experience in school and how you were um what you were going through there and you know go, we'll kind of go from there yeah i'm um, uh i i basically i ran for fun uh, interestingly, I got asked to do cross country. I got asked to do track because my times, uh, during PE were, uh, basically I was beating everybody in the mile right. and, uh, and, this and I was, was like, nah. North Idaho, correct? Yeah, this is in North Idaho. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, yeah. And, and in high school and I was like, nah, that's, that's, that's all good. I, I just run for fun. You know, mm-hmm. I run because I, I love to do it. Um, but I, I love playing soccer and I played soccer all throughout. I, I played uh, hockey, which was like uh, outside of high school. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I basically misstepped in my junior high years and didn't go out for football. So ended up, you know, I was like, what am, what am I thinking? What is this all about? This isn't about like having a certain friend group or being mm-hmm. like the, the right timing or something like that. And so I just, I laid it all out. I was like, no, nah, I'm just going to go, I'm going to do the sports that, uh, I've always wanted to do. So I went out for football. I ended up breaking my arm about a quarter of the way, third of the way through the season hmm. and healed up my arm and then went out for wrestling and then ended up, uh, going to regionals my first year yeah. trying it. And right. which isn't super incredible. I mean, state would have been obviously incredible in, in Idaho, but, but the thing is, it's like, man, what, what was I thinking? And so it was at that point that I realized, well, I always wanted to join the Marine Corps. And then I decided, okay, well, I'm just going to join the Marine Corps. Then whether my parents sign up on this or not, as soon as I turn 18 and I'm jumping in, unless they want to sign on the dotted line, then I'll, uh, I'll jump in at 17. What drew you into the Marine Corps? What was it something that you had known you wanted to do before high school or how, what made you make that decision? Yeah. The interesting part is I, there's no other way to really put it. I mean, I could belabor you with story after story and and not even belabor you, but uh, fascinate you even (laughs) with story after story of how God created me to be. I've always had a really high, um, need for justice. And Mm. I, I just always hated strong people preying on the weak. Um, I had a proclivity for, uh, nerds and dorks and stuff like that just because i i thought why are why are people making fun of them just because you know they i don't know they like weird games or they read books instead mm-hmm. of you know play sports or, or whatever um, so it was always for them you know i and i hate to, to cut you off there but i was a no, person, no, yeah. even as a football player when i wasn't the football player i was the isolated kid i was the kid that was kind of getting bullied and bullying being bullied isn't necessarily just physical being bullied is actually mental like oh, that's right. That's yeah. just ass one. That's just, you know, so many things. And it it I would love to tell you listeners that I would, you know, get into the adult world and everything changes. It is not like that. There's a lot of adults who still oh, yeah. have that mindset of staying in the comfort zone. So I, I I love the fact that you hate 
seeing people preying on the easy targets, you know. But mm -hmm. when you are an easy target at the same time, you know you're doing something special. If people talking about you, that means you're doing That's something right. right. So you know, you yeah, got, absolutely. You got to go early today, my man. So go ahead. <laughs> no, yeah, no. That I mean, that's all you hit it. I mean, that's so yeah. that's so true. And so, uh, you know, for me, it was like, well, what greater way to do this? And obviously, in my romantic youth, you know, you romanticize all of the, you know, kill the dragon, get the girl type scenario. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought, well, what other service would I go into? But the Marine Corps, right? I heard it was the hardest, uh, the most challenging. Um, and the most likely to end up having, you know, having to fight. Now that's all politics aside. That's romantic vision. I'm, I'm not trying to, you know, set some uh, political agenda or anything like that. That's clearly yeah. from the eyes of a young man, mm -hmm. uh, a young boy to a young man, seeing, seeing the necessity of the warrior to protect women, to protect children and to protect those that cannot protect themselves. And that's, yeah. that was the great, gravitas that was a great calling into uh the marine corps and and so when when i you know went out for football and, and went out for wrestling and i was like ah you know obviously you're not going to break I, I i knew that i wasn't going to break you know playing soccer and, and playing hockey yeah. um but it's like man if i can do this then i can definitely do that i'll just train a little bit harder uh, work a little bit harder um interesting story. I joined the Marine Corps and I actually got out of shape in the Marine Corps. That's how in shape I got before I joined the Marine Corps, wow. uh, which I know sounds ridiculous and sounds like, oh no, he's lying. No, I'm telling you, I gained 20 pounds in boot camp, which is the opposite of most people's story, but I was a twig too. So I'll, I'll take that. And, and I was, that's how much I was running and doing push-ups and, and lifting and all that stuff before I went in uh, to the Marine Corps. And obviously out of boot camp, you know, I, I've started doing my own uh, regimen again and then found units and found men that were like way higher level than I was. I was like, okay, this is, these are the units that I want to rub elbows with and be a part of. So while you were in there, you, you mentioned like the romantic vision that you had for mm -hmm. when you were there, what was the actual experience like? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I, I explained this to somebody the other day, and th and this is obviously caricaturing it, so bear with me a little bit, but it is humorous. I was like, uh, so basically the military is 95% waiting around for the 5% to happen. If you're lucky, you get a 5% mm. action, right? 5% romantic vision. Yeah. Uh, and that's including training. That's including, uh, and I went to combat, so that's including combat, right? Yeah. And I had sort of uh, the best case scenario, I got to train for three and a half years uh, with the Marine Corps in 29 Palms, which is the desert of all deserts, mm -hmm. but lots of training, high, uh, you know, high training tempo, and then went into the theater, went into Iraq, and then um, actually was, was in combat right. as a Marine infantryman, you know, uh, day you in, were, day you out. You were actually leader. You were leading men into leading That's into right. battles, right? So that's correct yeah what, what was that like because i i'm i don't compare myself to actually going to war but being a captain mm -hmm. on multiple football teams and being voted captain i kind of know the feeling of your peers looking up to you you know even though that's they're right. your same age and just having that responsibility obviously while i was playing a game your life and death situation so what did that do to you knowing that these men are trusting you with their life like you're you're someone that was trusted how did that I'm sure it still affects you to this very day, even in the fatherhood and being a husband and things like that. Yeah, um, I pity those that take um, take all of the freedoms of leadership and and leave all of the responsibility. Um, mm. It's it's there's something about you know they say heavy lies the crown, right? And and, and there's the, there's a lot of cliche. Crown, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot of cliched kind of, but it's true. It, there is a there is a heavy burden to bear as a, a leader, because at the end of the day, whether you did it or not, it was your responsibility. Mm. Um, it was your responsibility to train them. It was your responsibility to parent your, ch your children. It was your responsibility mm. to, um, you know, water your wife with the word, um, to, mm. to love her in a sacrificial love, like Christ loves the church. Mm. This is your responsibility to do. And, mm. and now obviously in Christ, we can do all things, but this is this is me pre uh, salvation, mm -hmm. um, and so it was even heavier for me. And I, I'll be honest; I mean, I was I was very hard to work for. 
um, mm. because I expected only the highest standard and I uh, constantly tested it. You inspect what you expect. Mm -hmm. So constantly inspecting it and then constantly pushing to get more and more and more. But the interesting part was as soon as combat came around, I told, I gathered my small group of men that I was in charge of. And I said, Hey guys, um, the pressure's off now. You will get no more pressure from me, but mm -hmm. all of the pressure will come from this life and death scenario that we are confronted with. Right. So I will no longer yell at you. I will, I mean, unless they fell asleep on watch or did something totally ridiculous, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's like, I will no longer yell at you. I, I will no longer um, put you through the physical crucible that, uh, that you've been going through and that I got put through as well. And I appreciate my NCOs for putting me through that yeah. and being that example those are the things that I can glean from the Marine Corps and take into real life and go, yeah, we need to put ourselves in scenarios like football, you know, yeah. where it's like, yeah, it's not life or death, but your, your whole goal is to win. And there is a great cost that you must pay in training in practice mm -hmm. before the game and in the game to get that W right. Yeah. Unless it's just a blow over team, but then yeah. it's, but then there's no glory in that. Right. It's just, yeah, yeah. you crush them and whatever, you know, exactly. so yeah. yeah. So the, you know, one of the things, and I'm glad you mentioned the importance of leadership because the, the person that runs away from these responsibilities, I, I actually wanted, when I got into coaching, one of the books that was recommended to me by a coach was flags of our fathers. I believe it's mm. Bradfield, James Bradfield, I believe the name is. And the, again, there's so many similarities and this isn't just a football thing, but this is just how you develop as men and the journey that you go on and the responsibility and the expectation that you need to be setting yourself up as men. And you mentioned that you were a hard leader to work for. And I always say, look, there's no other way to do it. You got to be an asshole. Yeah. You cannot be, you cannot go from being nice and then all of a sudden be an asshole when it's time for combat, you got to only right. be an asshole. And then when the time, when game time comes, like even my college coach, coach Pete, he would be screaming every practice. I, I saw him in the game one time, calm, peace. It's just, you yeah. got to just go play. And, and that is so, it, it's such a huge lesson that I, I pity this the person that doesn't get to experience that. But you are, yeah. so you left and did you just jump right into fitness? You had mentioned that there was a lot of things that went on there that before you met your wife, before you met your, you know, had your kids that you had mm -hmm. through some, some times, man. So, you know, you yeah. feel free to go ahead and kind of share about your journey from then to, you know, now where you're your family, man, and you're seem like you're a little more reserved. Yeah. Now. You're a little more calm now. So yeah, that, that's true. I, I'm still a little bit high strung, but yeah, I know, it, I know it's, the in there. It's, it's there, in me, so, but you know, you yeah. learn how to control it a little bit. That's right. That's right. Well, and, and, you know, I, I ought to give grace because in a, in overabundance of grace was given to me um, yeah. clearly uh, because I know my past, you know, I know how bad I, I my thoughts were and my actions were and my right. words were, um, but it, it, you know, when you pray a prayer, like I did, because I really did want to know the deeper wise, like, why do we exist? Why is there something rather than nothing? What is our purpose here on this planet? And you pray that right before combat and you say, God, if you're real, you're going to kill me. And then you don't die. And then you say, well, well God doesn't exist. You know, is, is that was my mindset, right? right? That was my paradigm shift. And then you start to spiral down in that nihilistic belief of nothing. Like I didn't believe in meaning. I didn't believe in purpose. I didn't believe in values. I was like, I'll just pretend with everybody else mm. um, that there is such a thing as values, that there is such a thing as truth and goodness and beauty. But uh, deep down in my soul, I didn't really believe that, except I still couldn't shake that morality piece, which was watching somebody strong prey on somebody weak. It still just got to me like, you know, like sand in your, in your sleeve that's rubbing in your yeah. elbow and you right. just, you can't get it out. Um, right. <clears throat> and so then I went chasing after, you know, figuring that out. But I'll tell you in that nihilistic spiral, when, when, you know, my wife and I, we call those our dark days, you know, I was just, I was the worst, you know, I, I imagine somebody that's pretending that there's such a thing as truth and goodness and law and all these things. And yet in their heart of hearts, doesn't actually believe it. Um, there's no telling what you can do with that. I mean, greed, power, money, fame, you know, you can chase all of these things for all of the wrong reasons and right. just poison every well that you end up at. Right. And, and, and I lost friendships and I lost relationships and I, I have, 
have since had to apologize to more people than I can count, mm -hmm. um, than I can fathom, because I realized the travesty of that is that, no, there is such a thing as truth and goodness and beauty. And that is what we are seeing around us. And it's undeniable. And God did create this. And, and even more, I've been forgiven right. of the things that I don't deserve to be forgiven for. Mm -hmm. And, and so how much more than I'm, I'm, you know, I, I spent a long time and a lot of time meeting up with people face to face or calling them on the phone and just saying, Hey, I'm sorry. It, um, please forgive me for objectifying you or for treating you as a means to an end or mm -hmm. for um, trying to use you and abuse you in the same way that I despised when I watched other people do that. It's yeah. like, no, I became the thing that I hated. You didn't want to become. And, so yeah. when you're going through this spiral, so many people, and, and this is, again, for you listeners as well, so many people, when they're going through these difficult times, they, we tend, and I've, I've had similar situations too, we tend to cover it up. We tend to yeah, right. kind of put on a mask and things like mm -hmm. that. Can you speak a little bit to that? Because I think it's important for people to understand that when they know somebody is also going through it, they become mm. more they become more willing to share their truth and it gets them out of that place a whole lot sooner. Like yeah. you had mentioned a lot of the women that you objectified. You had mentioned the friendship, the relationships and so many things, but there are kids now, so especially that are probably listening to the show that feel like they're untouchable. They have yeah. you know, the, the likes yeah. and the Instagram and they, they're looking good. They're feeling good. They feel like they are untouchable. So can you speak to them a little bit in terms of how do you pull yourself out of that and don't, mm. you know, don't send a representative and stuff like that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So I think first and foremost, uh, we're going to con continually try to justify our existence and what it is that we do, right? So if I'm doing bad things, I'm going to figure out ways to jump through hoops and to play the circus games that I need to play, you know, mentally to, to be the good person or to be the, 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 the good leader or whatever. But at the end of the day, you have to look at yourself in the mirror or in the morning, you have to look at yourself in the mirror. And I'm telling you right now, you are lying to yourself while you are also lying to other people. And the thing is that darkness that, that we hide, it doesn't get smaller when you manipulate or justify or figure out a way so that you don't have to actually feel the pain of it. Mm -hmm. What happens is it actually gets bigger. It gets darker, it gets more gross, it gets, and it gets bigger and it gets harder and harder and harder to hold. Yeah. Um, and, and I think that's why, uh, this is real talk. I think that's why there's a lot of men that get out of the military, my friends included, that end up killing themselves because what they don't do is is the very thing that we don't want to do, but we need to do. And that's shine the light on it. The darkness doesn't get brighter when you keep it in the dark. It only gets brighter when you shine the light on it, which means you have to confess all of it, bring it all to bear. And if, and if right now, if I remembered something from 20 years ago that I did that was wrong, it's like, okay, I'm going to bring that to the light too. And at least I'm going to confess that to God. If I can find the person and make amends, then I'm going to do that as well. But you have to bring that to the light because otherwise now that little darkness is going to control you. You think that you're in charge, but no, it's your sin. It's your darkness. That's actually controlling you. And because you have to justify and lie. It's like a, a lie doesn't, doesn't become less of a lie. A lie always becomes more of a lie, right? You got to figure out another way to say it, another way to, to, to adjust what you're saying and what you're doing to cover up that lie. And then that, that's another lie. And then that's another lie. Right. And, and while they seem small after a while, they build up and they become unbearable. And right. so, yeah, shine a light into it. Confess it to a friend that you trust, that you that you love, that you trust, that loves you, and say, "Hey, man, I'm and, and test it. Confess right. one thing, like say one thing, say one thing that you know is rotten and wrong, and and you want it to be pure, and you want to let it go, yeah. right? Confess that, and and I'll say. So the hardest thing for me to do was, um, you know, in my childhood, I was sexually abused. What was to forgive that person. Um, because much like that darkness, right? Me not forgiving him is me trying to control his pain. So I'm trying to punish him by, by drinking the poison that I'm thinking that he's, that he's imbibing, but it's like, no, I'm drinking that poison. I'm holding on to it. 
And, and by me holding on to it, I'm holding on to that darkness. I'm holding on to that. But it, once I forgive him and I say, Hey, uh, you know, you were brought up wrong or, or whatever the case was that you decided to do this horrible thing to me, yeah. I'm going to give that back to you because I don't want to hold on to this anymore. Because if I hold on to it, now it's going to control me. Now I'm going to think about all that. And I've become a victim. If you're a victim, you cannot actually take actionable steps yeah. forward. You can only play that victim role. Oh, I'm too hurt. I'm too this. I, I can't, I can't, whatever. And it's like, once I gave that to him, mm -hmm. man, it was like this weight was lifted. And then I had to keep doing it because it would keep coming up and I would keep wishing ill on him and, you know, wanting to, again, drink that poison. And, but that's a, that's a good example of what it was that I was doing as well by asking people for, for, for my forgiveness. Now, whether they forgive, gave me or not, right. That's up to them. Right. But I, it, now it no longer controls me. That darkness is not, I'm not slave to, to sin. I'm not slave to darkness. I'm not mm -hmm. slave to the thing that happened to me. I can learn from my past, but relinquish it. And now I can move forward and be free for the first time ever. Right. Yes. Well, I, I definitely, I can't tell you how much I appreciate your vulnerability and being willing to share that. We actually had a previous guest. Her name is Donna, who was, went through a similar situation and she got pregnant at 14 and mm -hmm. I, I haven't been sexually assaulted, but I've been bullied by adults, been physically draped up steps, slammed against the wall. And I asked her from a really tough place, how do you forgive? You know, how do you forgive? Because yeah. the question, and I've even had, when I, as a pastor, I got really close with, like, when I first got out here in Florida, I asked them, how do you forgive without forgetting? And Donna made it very clear, and it's on camera. It's, the episode isn't out yet, but it'll be out soon. She says, no one said you have to forget. <laughs> no yeah. one said you have to forget at all, but you got to yeah. stop drinking that poison. You got to stop drinking. Yeah. I'm talking to you, Lizzie. You got to stop giving that, yeah. that person. I, I wanted to use a different word, but you got to stop giving that person <laughs> the power over you because that's, that's right. not the power they deserve. When you stop that's drinking right. that poison and you're able to, again, I'm reserved, just like I told you, reserved kid, played football, was not the kid that deserved that at all. I'm sure you, no kid deserves to go through that kind of shit. No. If you keep giving them that poison, if you keep giving it to them by not forgiving, then you can't do the things you're doing now. You can't build yeah. the leadership organization that you've built now. So, you know, I'd love for you to just kind of walk us through the moment in which you you kind of felt like you broke free. Where was that breakthrough mm -hmm. moment for you? And I'll, I'll actually I'll give you an example. It was something just a, maybe four or five months ago, I still was struggling to this day, was pornography. And mm -hmm. for about, I've been porn free for maybe six, uh, yeah, close to about four or five months now. And it was actually mm -hmm. listening to a current pastor, former athlete on a podcast. And I listened to how bad, how damaging the whole thing made his life that made me say, mm -hmm. man, you know, has a podcast, does a lot of the work I'm doing. I'm like, that's mm -hmm. a former athlete. That could have been me. And if I'm given to that, then I'm ruining society, even though I may just be watching quote unquote. And again, we're football football mm -hmm. guys. We used to have this shit playing in the locker room. We we did yeah. not think it was a bad thing at all. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. when someone tried to tell me that porn was a bad thing, I'm like, ah, you know, I'm not I'm celibate, but still, <laughs> come on, like, come yeah. on, like, give, yeah. me, give me something about like it's not that. But yeah, I officially have stopped doing it, and the weights lifted off. And I tell people mm -hmm. all the time, it just isn't worth it. So you know, kind of walk us through some of the um. Yeah. the moments or I guess the weeks leading up to your breakthrough and how you were able yeah. to do that and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, um, from the nihilism, right. I needed to find the reason why behind what I was noticing, which is strong people preying on weak and why I yeah. thought so strongly that that's immoral because if, if there is no value, if there's no meaning, if there's no purpose, then I shouldn't feel these feelings. Right. And so I just thought, Oh, I need to, you know, I just try to ignore it, try to ignore it. Couldn't ignore it. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to jump in to, figure out the reason why. And I was like, but, but I'm not going to go Christian because, you know, I, I started in a charismatic church and then ended up Roman Catholic, kind of a weird childhood, totally two ends of the spectrum, whatever. Well, but if, I was like, nah. We're talking religion here, the rules and religion. That's another thing we kind of touched on with, I mean, we'll be on here for another couple of hours. It's a relationship yeah. with God, folks. Prayers, a conversation with God. That's the right. religion and the rules, they're there as guardrails. So they start 
curating excuses yep. to judge people and things like that. You know, you might bring yeah. as, as one might come out on you real quick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, so, so yeah, yeah, and so I I jumped into all these uh, like Hinduism and Buddhism and yeah. and and so every every religion that I would go into, mm -hmm. I would get the book, I would get a, a like a spiritual mentor or, or a guru or you know whatever. And then I would go to their ashrams if they had it and I would practice whatever they told me to practice. So like self-realization fellowship, I was meditating two to four hours every single day, read Bhagavad Gita, read autobiography of wow. a yogi, got a, a, got a spiritual mentor, went to all their ashrams, right? All this stuff. But all of them, they were always like a few questions away from just logical absurdity. Like, well, that doesn't make sense. Huh. And so I was like, okay, last ditch effort, I'm going to try Christianity um, and I'm going to do it the same way. I read the Bible cover to cover. Mm -hmm. I joined a men's group. I got a pastor who was my mentor walking me through asking yeah, me, that, this yeah. man was incredible. Ian Stevenson, just asking the best questions and making me spin for days, right. On mm -hmm. these questions. And, yeah. and then I went to church uh, every single Sunday. So it's like, that's what I did. And I did it for like a year and a half. And mm -hmm. I remember we, we were sitting in a Starbucks, May 21st, 2009. And he's like, Aaron, I love that you're wrestling with this. I love that you're giving all of this effort. I love that you're pouring your heart into really figuring out why, you know, there's such a thing as good and bad and why there is, is there truth or, or uh, is, is, is it just relative, you know, all of these things. He's like, but I can't help but notice you're trying to control all of it. Mm -hmm. Why don't you let go and give your life to God? Hmm. And I was like, bam, it just hit me hard. And I was like, okay, this is it. I mean, if, if, if that is, if that is the why behind all of it, right. you're, you're my, I submit my life to you, God, I'm giving my, my whole life to you. I don't know what that looks like. Right. And most people are like, ah, and then I got all these blessings and you know, every life was great after that and joy and ball and me, it was the exact opposite. I, it was during 2008, 2009, I lost 75% of my business because the real estate bubble popped. It was a fitness company, 75% of my business. What felt like overnight, it was like in a couple of months, mm -hmm. I lost every single friend because I didn't have friends at, at the church that I was going to yet. I had some men that I would go to the men's group with, right. um, but no friends really. Um, every single, um, female interest, right. That I was most of them objectifying and, and all that, all of those are gone because I, I, every other page, I felt like I read sexual immorality and I was like, okay, can't yeah. go there. Um, yeah. that all stopped. I lost like 30 pounds of muscle. I lost that had a, a really strong widow's peak of hair. I literally lost it. What it felt like overnight. Mm -hmm. Um, so all of, from all outside perspective, I was unsuccessful. I was a failure, right? Like all of the worldly metrics I was losing. And it yeah. was the first time I felt contentment in my entire life. And I was like, if this is it, I will do this for the rest of my life. This, this, it, this is exactly the question, the prayer that I was praying in combat, the questions that I had as a youth, um, the questions that I had that I was searching, you know, for the answer in all these other religions for. Mm -hmm. And it was through my relationship with Jesus Christ, yeah. obedience to him, submission to him for the first time in my life ever. That That's amazing. And I'm glad you shared it so eloquently because as myself, listeners got to understand when you have nothing, you can receive everything at the state of having nothing. I mean, the, the material things, the money, the businesses, the car, all the stuff that the world uses to give you value, strip it all away, get it all off your chest. And then you're just bare naked. You're just all you have is you. It's those moments that actually define you. It's those moments where you're able to prove it to yourself that you're going to be able to do whatever it is you're trying to do, not because you're by yourself, but because you have one person and one person to look to, and that's God, that's your Savior. you got to get to that place. You cannot get in the habit of depending on other people like human flesh because we're all going to make mistakes, and you can't get to the habit of depending on a material thing to validate your worth. It is That's an right. ugly, ugly, ugly place to live. I I see people every. I'm in Florida. I'm in West Palm Beach, Florida. I see it every <laughs> all day, every day. day. Okay, it's <laughs> it's rampant. There's a ton of money. I mean, 
and the way they are, like the mindset a lot of them have is like they can have all the money in the world and they completely are unhappy and they don't know what to do with it. Please, please, please hear me from my heart when I tell you this. Don't let that be you. And I, I do want to give you the opportunity to now with that, with all that being said, to speak on your company, Leaders vs. Leaders, because I know you do yeah. some things with the kids and I know there's ways mm -hmm. with you. And I, I'm honestly curious, just even from a perspective of someone that works with kids, is how do you mm -hmm. gauge kids in this activity? Because I know for a fact, talking to my 15-year-old self or my school self would have heard this and been like, come on, man, but my girl got, she's got, you know, <laughs> she's got some, you know, like I would have been, it, but, you know, the older me gets it, but I'm thinking back to my 15-year-old self and I'm curious how you, how do you gauge the young people in this kind of conversation just to keep them interested? Yeah, well, so first of all, you know, so I went and, and spoke and taught uh, leadership and mm -hmm. leadership development to a bunch of youth at uh, like a, it was the rodeo crowd. So it was steer riding, a steer riding camp. Mm -hmm. And so this uh, can, uh, Canada's best bull rider, uh, Dakota Butter, he teaches the skills part of it. I'm not a bull rider. Um, and um, and but I get to teach the the leadership portion of it. And the beauty is there's kids there that are like that. They're, they're just, they're kind of totally in the world. They're all about the buckle. They're all about the best ride. They're all about looking the coolest, mm -hmm. being the toughest, you know, all of this stuff. And then there's kids there that they're sold out for the Lord. I mean, they are um, totally just all of my life uh, to all of Christ for mm -hmm. the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, and so having those conversations, obviously the, the, the child that's already a Christian or the, the young kid or the young boy or the young man, that's already a Christian, you can, you can use those words, right? You can talk to him, Hey, grab him by the baptism, right? So to speak mm -hmm. and, and be like, no, you're baptized into the body of Jesus Christ. And every time that you're sinning now, mm -hmm. here's the thing. You, you're able to confess, but if you're making conscious choices to continue to sin again and again, you mm -hmm. keep hanging Jesus Christ on the cross. You keep having him suffer the wrath of, of the scourges and, and whips. And, and you know that that's not right. But the kid who's like all about the buckle and all about the fame, mm -hmm. we're, we're having conversations like old me. It's like, well, mm -hmm. why is, do you think that there's, you know, why is there something rather than nothing? And so yeah. we're, we're, t we're starting from just, do you even believe in the possibility mm -hmm. of God? And yeah. then if you believe in the possibility of God, now let's walk into, so why is that a possibility? Right. Um, and, and I do believe that, you know, nation uh, or uh, in general revelation, natural revelation, right. That the, that nature screams out the glory of God. Like we can, it's undeniable. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that we don't, try to deny it. Right. I was in that boat. I tried to deny it. Uh, and I was going after all sorts of things that made me feel good. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, but the problem is you can get into that feel good cycle. And then before you know it, you're trying to scroll TikTok to try to find the bottom of it. And there is no bottom and you're never going to be satisfied. Well, cause satisfaction isn't going to be found in, in lust, in sex, in all of these, there is a bit of truth. Satan does this. He makes a little hook Mm -hmm. And that little hook, he puts a little bait on there that's a little bit of truth. Mm -hmm. And then you bite that hook and then he pulls you into desolation and despair. Wow. Right. And so then I get to have these conversations with these kids. It's like, look, it's it seems really cool and it feels really good because that's how God designed it. Yeah. But then you get pulled into despair because now you're chasing after more and more and more and more and more of that. And that's not how the cosmos were created. That's not how God designed it. And then you wonder why you feel alone and mm -hmm. scared and insecure. It's right. because you did it wrong, homie. You mm -hmm. bit the bait yeah. and you got pulled into desolation and despair. You so, yeah. yeah. And I, well, as you're talking, I, I mean, because I was with my high school girlfriend for four years. And to be honest with you, Aaron, we should, we wouldn't even been friends. We shouldn't even have been together as just That's right. friends. But again, she had was willing to put out and all that kind of stuff. And I remember my senior year, I was doing my driving test and the guy asked me, you have a girlfriend? And I'm like, yeah, I do. He looks at me, he goes, I can tell you've had that girlfriend for a long time. <laughs> 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 you know, so to you young guys, man, just cause she's putting it out there. Other men who've been through that, they can feel it on you and you've been pulled in that hook. 
you'll be yeah. drained. You won't have the feeling of, all right, I'm, I'm filled with something new and positive and the energy will just simply yeah. be drained. And you, you actually, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. You actually have a program. It's called rites of passage that you put people through, um, you know, feel free to speak on that a little bit. Yeah. And, and so the sort of the cornerstone of, mm -hmm. of leaders of leaders and, and discipled past tense discipled in Christ is the app. It's for free on Android or iPhone. Mm -hmm. Um, and 100 in a strength is the discipleship course, which is kind of the cornerstone course. So it's a hundred days. I understand that humans, we, we, are designed to enjoy habit, take habits, turn them into routines, take routines, and then that becomes our lifestyle. And mm -hmm. then we can commit those lifestyles to Christ and 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 feel that fulfillment and contentment that comes from that. And so it's 30 days to make it a habit. And then the next 30 days is a routine. The next 30 days is to take that routine, turn it into a lifestyle. And the last 10 days is committing that lifestyle to Christ. That's the discipleship part. But for children, um, we have, like you just said, the driving test. We have all these like really crappy rituals, rites mm -hmm. of passage. Um, I turn 18, I can buy a smut magazine. I can yeah. buy cigarettes. Like, well, yeah, now yeah, I think yeah. it's 21 yeah. or whatever. It's like, uh, I, I barely made it through high school, but I get this diploma, whatever, mm -hmm. or I barely tried and I get this diploma. Right. Um, every once in a while we, we come upon something that's that's difficult, that's challenging, that's worthy of our effort. Mm -hmm. And, and those are the things that make memories. Those are the things that we talk about. And so for you, like football, you know, mm -hmm. for me, the Marine Corps and, and, right. you know, some other things in my, obviously my journey with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Um, and so those are the things that we want to share because they were true adventures, which what is the adventure? It's something challenging. You, you mm -hmm. risk failure. Like you can actually fail yeah. And then, and you have to put all of your effort into it in order to actually achieve it. Mm -hmm. And then it, it means something to you. You get to hold that for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And so I, I designed this because basically we pulled our kids out of school because during COVID they were trying to teach them with screens. And I was like, no, nah, we're not going to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was, I had to become a private school, my own private school, my own principal. Oh, like so home, I designed home, our home school, the kids. Yeah. So we homeschool. Oh, right. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. Yep. And, uh, yeah. And so, and so it started to make me think, which, you know, kind of feel like an idiot. It's like, well, okay, parent, you, you should have already thought about this, but this is normal. This is like normal societal, um, action and inaction, right. That, that happens with all of us. And yep. I started to think, man, what, what do, what do I want for my kids? What do I want from my children? What do yep. I want from my children's children? Mm -hmm. And, and how, how, how can I help them embrace that and really own that? And it was like, well, I'm going to create these rites of passage. And so I did a 12 year old rite of passage, a 16 year old, 18 year old rite of passage. Mm -hmm. And the 12 year old is like a five day ordeal. I mean, they're doing all sorts of physical things, mental things, spiritual things um, that you, that I actually have to be consistent in training my children in the way in which they should go. <laughs> right. And, uh, or raising my kids up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Right. In order for her, in, or, in order for my daughter, Hannah, or in order for my daughter, Ellie, or my son, Jack, mm -hmm. or, or my uh, new daughter, Francis, to, to be able to pass it. So it actually held, held me parents accountable. And so this rite of passage is actually more about holding parents accountable to being parents mm -hmm. so that their children can hang their hat on something that is incredibly challenging, incredibly adventurous, uh, runs the risk of failure, mm -hmm. um, and, and then, and then when they've earned it, they've earned something more than just, all right, add a girl. Okay. Now you're 12. Okay. Now you're 16. Um, it's no, you've earned these freedoms. You've earned these responsibilities. You are no longer a child. I will never call you a child again. Right. Our community will come around and affirm that we will never call you a child again. You are now an adolescent. You have earned that. Mm -hmm. You've earned every bit of that. And there's, and it's just awesome to watch my daughter, Hannah. She just accomplished this. Yeah, that, actually, that's, what, that's what I was going to ask you. Like, what have the results been? Any parent, if there's any parents listening in, how they can, you know, engage with you when it comes to that. So. Yeah. And, and so I don't, I don't expect parents. I've talked to a lot of parents now and, and help them design their own rites of passage. And so obviously I kind of talked through, these are the principal things they need to, they, there needs to be in there. Mm -hmm. Um, but that you don't need to do all of the things that I did. Um, mm -hmm. but you can, you could pull that 
and I don't consider it plagiarism. I consider it passing on the torch of, right, right. of truly earning something that's, that's worthy uh, to be earned. Um, right. And will actually glorify God um, yeah. by your child, no longer being a child and being an adolescent right. and they'll be better off for it. You'll be a better parent for it. And mm -hmm. you'll have a, a healthier, happier, more contented household because of it as well. And right. so, yeah, like now, you know, I have no problem. Hannah can go on her own. She can, she can go off and do stuff. And I don't, I'm not worried about her. I mean, mom still worries, but that's what moms do. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but I no longer worry about her. You know, she's, she's strong enough. She's got really, she can, she understands baselines and anomalies. Like she can see if bad man is, is doing bad things. I'm going to create space and time. I'm going to go a different direction. Yes. Um, you know, we, we literally, she, she showed how to do a tourniquet, how to do CPR, AED, how to uh, splint a bone, how to do C spine stabilization. The next day mm -hmm. we got into a head on collision and, and it, what it did was that, and obviously I did not, try to make that part of the rite of passage. No, no, that was God's no, hand in not, it, no, right? right? Right. But she realized mm -hmm. how important all of those things that she just demonstrated the effectiveness of right. the day before were because I was doing C-spine on a lady and I, and we almost had to do CPR on her. And there, I mean, it was chaos, but it was like, she could watch dad be cool, calm, collected, do what needed to be done right. to save lives. Right. And then, and then we just, we, we were both fine. Uh, you know, God's hand was on us. Yes. Totally fine. And so then we went on a five mile run, you know, which is yeah. what we plan on doing anyways that day. So that's amazing, man. So if, if like, if people want to work with you, you know, where do you see the organization growing? What can you kind of tell people what's next and how they can, you know, just get involved in some way, shape, form or fashion, because I per, pretty first, I teach at a school that mm -hmm. the majority of the kids are being raised in broken homes and their okay. parents, there's some that are trying, man. They, they really mm -hmm. are genuinely trying, but their lack of resources, their inability, sometimes they just feel helpless. So can you just mm -hmm. kind of speak on, you know, what's, what's next and how they can get, how they can work with you. Yeah, absolutely. So they can, I mean, they can hop on, they can download that app, Disciple yeah. in Christ. They can go yeah. through the course. There's a rite of passage course where I explain all of this stuff in great mm -hmm. detail. They can see specifically the the curriculum that I used, right, to bring my daughter uh, through it. Um, and then I'm bringing my family through. Mm -hmm. um, and then, and then, yeah, if they want to, they can, they can reach out to me. I'll connect with them probably if they, if they jump on Discipled mm -hmm. in Christ. Um, typically that's the easiest way to get a hold of me. And then they can ask me a bunch of questions. And then if they want coaching, uh, you know, I, I'll carve that out. We can have that discussion. Um, but my, my whole goal in it was it's, it's going to be donor funded and I'm going to just put everything mm -hmm. out there and I'm going to put it all out there for free and I'm going to do it to the glory of God. And I want to see families, broken homes. Yeah be healed in Christ and, and then, and then do incredible things, the incredible things that we all have, we all have unfulfilled potential, right? And it, and it is just something beautiful to see somebody starting to fulfill their potential, watch them, you know, grow into those big shoes that yeah. they put on, right. That whether it is rite of passage or, or right. discipleship or, you know, whatever path they ended up taking. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, every, any step of the way, every step of the way I can be there. Um, or, Hey, I'll, I'll just give you a couple pointers, you know, whatever the case might be. If they want well, me to your, speak. Um, or... What does your coaching entail? Is it, are you going back to the fitness stuff or is it just kind of coaching them on how to, to work through the leadership uh, development? No, it's, yeah, it's all, it's all leadership development. It's, it's, it's establishing that Christ is Lord of leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, and if he's Lord of leadership, we can look to him and, and we can emulate that and, and see incredible change, not only for ourselves, but all of our spheres of influence. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, I'll do, I'll do speaking gigs. Um, I'll, I'll do trainings like I, I did for the steer riding put sure. together a curriculum specific mm -hmm. to, you know, and I've done steer riding and I've done uh, a mountain, like men of the mountain stuff. And I've done mm -hmm. a bunch of different types of events, commander of course. Uh, yeah. I was a part of something called the special force experience. And then that's what I do for uh, the Marine Corps reserves um, all the time. So we I've worked with yeah. three letter agencies and, and all of that. And so I love to sit down with, you know, somebody who has a vision yes. It's like, Hey, let's chop out a, an event right. that's going to, change people's 
paradigms, right? Shift their paradigms and get them to take, start taking steps in the right direction. And then if they need to, you know, I, I, I think the important part is that follow-up. Like a lot of times, like we can have this cool tent revival moment, but then, or, but then we come down off the mountain and then everybody just goes back to normal. It's like, well, that ain't, that ain't helping anybody. That is the key. I'm glad you mentioned that because you can get that sugar rush just like going to see a motivational speaker, just like going to church one time, but you got to take all of this at home and apply it to your day to day life, moment to moment, day to day, whatever it is you have to do. It's not going to do you any good to just do it once. All right. So Mm -hmm. very, very important that you take that home and take that into consideration as well, which is why this show comes out every single day. I don't want you just hearing it once and then drop it off. Nope. Tune in every single day. There'll be a brand new episode. So all that being said, Aaron, the, uh, the way I close out all the shows is I want you to use your imagination a little bit. Pretend you are back in high school pretend that that young high school version of Aaron has come into the zoom room where he's struggling with insecurity. He is just hates the way that bullies push younger people around the whole thing. Pretend that that boy is here, give him some words of encouragement and we'll officially close. Yeah. Uh, I mean, basically I would just go up to him and slap him in the face and be like, you ain't going to listen to me anyways, boy. <laughs> <laughs> but if he actually did listen to me, yes, sir. Like, yes, sir. Sometimes like, the physical, the physical part actually works with oh, as guys, stubborn guys. Yes, <laughs> that's right. But no, if he actually did listen to advice, I'd be like, I would say, hey, th- don't make this your last piece of advice that you actually listen to. There's going to be a ton of wise counsel that mm-hmm. steps into your life. And I want you to actually not just listen to what they say as, as, the, the Bible says, right, don't just read it, don't just hear it, but mm-hmm. put it into action, obey, listen and obey, like actually, actually walk it out. And that's uh, obviously, I'm just parroting what you literally just got done saying. Mm-hmm. It's like, you got to put it, put it into action every single day. Right. Um, and, and if, man, if, if old me would have listened to new, uh, me now, or young me listen to old me, mm-hmm. uh, I wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have the story that I have now. Uh, I wouldn't have the the deep dark depths, um, which I don't think is I don't think it's a bad thing. There is beautiful glory in a boring testimony. Um, yeah, there yes. there is something amazing about that. Like man, I, that would be awesome. I'm obviously that is not my story. That's not how it was written, and I'm okay with that. Um, but uh, but yeah, man, if, if I could, that's what I would. Yeah, one of the actually one of my first few episodes was there was a girl who told me to read the book the gift of imperfection by Brene Brown so you know yeah that it is actually a gift being imperfect is actually the gift see the the beauty in your imperfections and things will work out you just got to stay focused so all that being said fellow teammates continue to move swiftly we will talk more soon